Um, obviously, we've had quite a bit of introduction to it. So uh, we have um, basically three presentations on the agenda uh, covering um, the MLX5 uh, work, and then Ceph, which is um, a project that Huawei is pursuing around XDP, and then ILA router on barefoot, uh, which kind of related. So I'm not going to give a lot of introduction. I think we've had um, uh, plenty from Dave yesterday and others. Uh, but I do want to remind you, the, the goals of XDP are pretty simple. It's fast, programmable, portable, um, high-speed data networking path. And XDP in a nutshell, it's a programmable interface. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going for high performance. The term bare metal packet processing is probably appropriate here. And use cases, um, and we're kind of undefined at this point. I think we're, in some sense, building a hammer. We'll see how it's used. Uh, hopefully, most of the use cases will be beneficial, but like a hammer, some people may be using it for interesting uh, malicious cases. Um, but that's life. I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely a powerful, um, kind of a powerful mechanism that we're building, so we're quite aware of that. So uh, this is one picture I didn't want, did want to bring up. It kind of shows the XDP uh, architecturally. And the thing I wanted to point out is that this kind of tan box in the middle is where the XTP happens. And the key is that the parsing, processing, BPF program is all the way down in the queue. And the output from this is uh, drop packet, receive into local stack, or forward packet. Um, so we have very simple action codes for these four things. So that's kind of uh, the overview of XTP, and with that, I will turn it over to Saeed, who will tell us about XTP and MLX5. My name is Said Mohamed. I'm uh, the maintainer of uh, MX5 driver. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, MX5 implementation of XTP. Um, so uh, I would like to tell our story implementing XTP as um, I think the second driver to implement uh, XTP after MX4. <coughs> um, I would like to visit some uh, aspects and the difficulties and challenges making uh, XDP possible um, over a device driver. Um, I would like to visit some um, our implementation of, uh, of RX mods and uh, memory models that uh, we had to change uh, in order to make uh, XDP a reality. Uh, I, I will uh, uh, explain how we implemented ArcStrap and uh, forwarding um, in details. And they uh, will uh, uh, at, le at last, we will discuss the performance numbers and uh, to, to show how, how great XDP is and what, sh what, what future implement, uh, improvements we can um, add to the XDP uh, architecture. So I will assume everyone knows what XDP is. Um, yesterday, they've uh, visited uh, all of the aspects of XDP. Um, so I would like to talk about what is required from the device drivers in order to have the XDP inside of them. So um, uh, XDP basically is, um, is a mechanism to allow the, an EPPF program uh, to run over a packet as soon as, it's, as, it, uh, as it arrives to the CPU um, after the device driver fetch it from the hardware. Um, the device driver should allow early drop um, before uh, even an SKB is uh, allocated. Um, the device driver should also uh, grant write access uh, to the packet um, for several use cases. Um, the device driver also should allow um, header pop and push, uh, so, uh, which means that the device driver should also um, guarantee a, a headroom and a tailroom. 
Um, also, the bus driver should respect um, a TX forward request from the EPPF program, um, which also adds some complexity to the RX routine of the driver. Uh, pet per packet is basically is a restriction, it's not a requirement. We will talk about that. So, w w why isn't it uh, uh, straightforward to implement uh, XTP um, over some device driver? Uh, first of all, uh, we talked about the restriction of, uh, of XTP uh, yesterday, and um, it is not just simply um, just hook the EPB program as soon as possible, and that's it. Um, the memory models of the driver has to be changed. Uh, from before, before XTP, uh, there was only uh, one state or two states of an RX buffer. Um, it's either the RX buffer is uh, sitting inside the hardware, waiting for a packet to arrive, or it's or it, it, it is received and it is now inside the stack. So uh, from before, uh, the SKB was allocated from the driver and uh, the, the stack uh, um, freed, frees it. So those are the only possible states. Uh, now with XTP, there are two more states. Uh, an RX buffer can be dropped or forwarded back to the port uh, uh, it came from. So um, w w I would like to discuss um, uh, how, how, how can we implement those uh, features and what complexity, complexity they add to the driver. Um, uh, also, uh, the XTP hook and the XTP restrictions, um, as I said, uh, XTP hook, hook must run uh, as soon as possible, um, which, which means that the implementation of the XTP hook is dependent to, uh, to the device driver, so it's not a vendor agnostic. Um, um, uh, as well, the uh, device driver should uh, now uh, allocate and preserve a headroom and a tail room for the XTB program to manipulate the packet, which wasn't uh, always the case. Um, also, XDB forward itself as a, an order, uh, adds an order of magnitude to the complexity of the ARX routine. Uh, the ARX routine from before was only responsible of, of receiving, receiving packets and passing them to the stack. Now it has uh, to, to support two, two new um, operations, uh, drop and forward, um, which means that the arc buffer might be kept in the um, device driver for smithing, and uh, the driver must wait for the smith operation to complete. Um, also, RX for, uh, forwarding from RX back path adds um, uh, more code to the to, to the RX path, which will hurt uh, the, the the data and destruction cache, and also will hurt latency. Um, pass, passing also a paid chunk to the forwarding uh, to the to the forwarding routine of the XTP will, will, will mean that uh, um, if the page if the the device driver uh, using a memory model which reuses the pages and the page has multi users. Uh, now, now a page can be uh, also um, has two packets. One of them uh, now went to the stack, and the other packet went back to the device as XTP forward uh, requested. And this is not allowed by XTP. So, um, so solution for that uh, should be uh, instead of page fragments or buffer, we 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 should only allow a page per packet and. It, uh, this is where uh, page per packet requirements come from, and we can we 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 we, we can resolve all the um, performance uh, reductions with the RX stagings and bulking, which uh, Jasper here um, suggests. Um, one more uh, uh, challenge: that uh, how how can uh, we uh, exchange XTP program on the fly? Um, uh, there were two suggestions to do that. One of them is the uh, RCU locking mechanism, uh, which was introduced and added to MLX4 driver. For my test, it, I think it was uh, a little bit complex, so uh, I suggested another uh, solution uh, to have NAP, synchroni NAP synchronization and uh, simply uh, halt the RX routine for a moment, exchange the, exchange the programs, and uh, res resume the uh, RX routines. 
Um, so uh, I would like to now to discuss the, uh, the two RX modes we have in our driver, uh, why both of them before XDP. Um, we cannot just simply, um, as I said, uh, run the XDP hook. Uh, we, we, we needed to change uh, our memory models uh, just to make uh, XDP uh, uh, satisfied and happy with the, uh, our memory model. Um, so I will go off the topic for a moment here and explain how uh, our RX modes work. Uh, the first one uh, we call is a linked list receive queue, which is uh, the, the uh, conventional uh, um, RX mode uh, that most of the drivers uh, now implement, uh, which simply um, means that uh, an RX ring have a hardware descript descriptor per packet, and the packet uh, and the descriptor points to a, a, an area of memory with at least a size of MTU. Um, uh, and also before XDP, uh, in MLX drive, MLX5 driver, we had a pre-allocated SKBs, and uh, and we mapped the the SKB a linear data buffer directly to the hardware, so. Uh, um, once a packet arrives, the SKB is pre-allocated and it's ready there, so this is not good for XDP. First of all, because we had to get free XDP if the uh, re result is dropped. Also, it wasn't a paid per packet, so we had to, 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 to change the memory model um, uh, to support XDP. Uh, the advantage of this, uh, um, this approach is that uh, allocating SKB from 32 uh, kilobytes SKB allocator was really fast and uh, we lost that. And we had to come up with some solution like page cache and page pools uh, to overcome the uh, degradation. Um, also, uh, one disadvantage of this approach is that uh, I think this is uh, also true for most of the drivers. Uh, there is a lot of memory waste. Um, I will visualize and explain in this uh, slide. Uh, so. Um, this is an example of uh, an RX ring. Um, uh, in MLX5, it was uh, SKB pre-allocated and ready waiting uh, for uh, incoming packets. Uh, let's assume the pack those packets are really small, uh, 64 uh, kilobyte or 64 bytes, and um, each packet will now uh, consume one SKB. And as we see here, the remainder of the SKB part, uh, the SKB linear part, is uh, is going to waste, and this is why we came up with the, um, what we call strutting RQ and uh, uh, byte stream uh, RX buffering. Um, uh, so this is uh, the, uh, uh, the situation before uh, XDP. So for XDP, we, we came up with this, the following solution. Now instead of uh, SKBs, we have um, a, a, a page per descriptor, uh, and now, uh, SKBs are allocated or built uh, on demand using build SKB. Um, also, we, we, we made sure we have uh, enough headroom and uh, uh, tear room of the size of the shared info just uh, to make build SKB happy and make it work. Uh, again, this works perfectly for uh, SKB, uh, XDP, and um, this is our current solution for XDP, which is upstream. But we are still not happy with the uh, memory waste. Um, so this is, um, yeah, we, 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 uh, now with this solution also the page allocator becomes the bottleneck and um, uh, we came up with the page pool and page recycling mechanism uh, to overcome this uh, degradation. But uh, still the memory uh, waste uh, is still there, and uh, this is why we have what we call sliding RQ and byte stream uh, buffering. Well, the, the idea here is that, um, first of all, you need the, uh, a hardware support for this feature, uh, which, we have, which we have in our Connectix 4 leaks and all the uh, upcoming generation of our, our hardware. Um, the idea here is that uh, each hardware descriptor has um, points to more than uh, an MTU buffer. It can point to any, any size of buffer you want. And uh, um, one, one hardware, hardware descriptor can uh, serve more than one packet. So uh, really, there is no uh, memory waste. I will visualize uh, later. 
Um, the advantages is that um, we don't have to access the hardware and write back the descriptor on each packet. Um, can be done once the, the, all the buffer is uh, consumed, uh, we, we will have to write back the, uh, the hardware descriptor to back to the hardware, to, to the RX ring. Um, current configura configuration is a 16 hardware descript descriptor versus one, 1K in the, um, in the previous model. And each one points to uh, uh, 128 kilobytes. Uh, you can do the math. It can uh, serve a lot of small packets, also a lot of MTU packets, uh, if you will. Um, there is more packet, uh, packet burst tolerance, um, no memory waste, also MTU agnostic. Um, since it doesn't depend on, on the MTU, you can have uh, even jump frame MTU, 9K. And the same model will work without even change, without even pre reallocating the uh, the rings. Uh, one, one disadvantage is that XDP will not work with this model because paid per packet is um, is not true here. Um, so uh, this is a, a visualiz visualization for this model. You can we can uh, we, we see here that our ring has only two pages, um, the, uh, only two, two pages. Um, Let's assume those pages are, are huge pages, um, and uh, for 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 the uh, previous example, we have two packets here um, and two hardware descriptor. The two packets now do not need to each one does not need to go to a different descriptor. Both can go continuously to the the, the same descriptor and consuming uh, the buffer without leaving gaps in between. Um, also, for as a future for for. Future work for XDP, um, uh, assuming that XDP will not uh, require a uh, page per packet anymore, um, we can do the following. Um, packet, packets can still go continuously to uh, a, a byte stream buffer. Um, we can uh, make sure from hardware that the hardware will preserve a headroom and a tail room, which is a well known for XDP. And also, we can tell the hardware uh, do not. Um, uh, to not cross pages, uh, each new packet, if, it's, if, if it does not, uh, uh, it cannot be inserted uh, conti uh, physically continuously to uh, a page, uh, we can skip to, uh, to uh, the, the, the second descriptor or, and, or the second page. Um, uh, also, we can do order zero pages. Uh, we, uh, those pages uh, for striding RQ uh, does not have to be uh, huge pages and con continuous uh, and physically continuous. We can, um, in our hardware, we support uh, virtual uh, mapping, so we can uh, per descriptor we can allocate uh, 32 pages and map them for one, uh, into one descriptor into the hardware, and the hardware can see th see them see them as virtually uh, continuous. So uh, there is no issue of having uh, studying RQ working with uh, order zero pages. Um, yeah, also order zero pages is good for the, the case where uh, DDoS attacks uh, occur. Um, we, we, we will not have a memory fragmentation. Um, and also, the zero pages uh, works well with the page pool and the page recycling mechanism uh, we added. Uh, some more advantages of this uh, uh, model is that the NIC DMA writes now can write uh, to a continuous buffer, which is uh, better for our DMA cache and performance, uh, less IMU cache misses. Um, uh, also, posting the ME buffer in a page granularity is uh, is more natural, um, and as I said, this is MTU agnostic. Um, uh, some numbers here, uh, comparing the, the the first model with the second one. Uh, as we see here, the first model can only handle one kilo, one k packets uh, for uh, for one pair. But this model, the new model, can can um, if we do the math, it can handle. Uh, uh, 32, 32k packets. Uh, if we are talking about uh, 64 byte packets, uh, as we see here, there are almost no drops uh, up to 32k packets, and we see uh, small drops once we uh, 
uh, expand the the bursts. Um, uh, one downside of this model is that currently the kernel does not um, does not have a, a, a normal API to configure the uh, the Rx buffer, uh, the size. Uh, the, the only API we have is uh, to configure the ring size, uh, which means how many descriptors we want. So we might uh, need to add in the future um, a, a normal API to uh, configure the starting arcade or the, the byte stream buffering uh, mechanism. Uh, let's go back to XDP. Um, I will talk about the implementation details and uh, we will discuss the performance number numbers um, we got with XDP. Um, okay, uh, XDP arc drop. Um, uh, in order to to, uh, to have XDP um, available into our driver, we had, uh, as I said, we had to uh, do a lot of refactoring and changing the memory model to uh, to be suitable with XDP. Um, uh, as I said, we ne we needed to change the XDP model. Uh, the, 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 the memory model to have a page per packet, um, we needed to uh, preserve a, a, a headroom and a tail room uh, with, a, with the size of SKB shared info in order to make build SKB work. Um, we had to add a page cache pool to cover the performance reduction and for XDP drop action, we recycled the page back to the, into the hardware which was really fast and this is where we see the good performance. For XDP pass, we just build this KB and pass to the stack. Um, as I said, for XDP program exchange, uh, we, we, for a teeny tiny uh, amount of time, we disable the RQ uh, handling and we nappy synchronize to flush all the uh, ongoing work, uh, ongoing running uh, XDP programs. We quickly exchange the program, uh, enable back the, uh, the receive queue or the ring and nap schedule in case we missed some packets. Um, for TX forwarding, it was a little bit uh, more complicated than that. Uh, we added a, a dedicated TX ring for, the, for each RX ring, and we made sure that the RX pages are writable so, XDP pro so EPPF programs can uh, modify the packets and send, send them back to the, step to, to the port. Um, on XDP TX, uh, we, 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 we put back put the packet into the XDP dedicated TX ring. Uh, if there is a place available, of course. Uh, we don't push the TX doorbell yet. Uh, maybe we have more packets as in, in the NAPI, in the NAPI uh, loop. Uh, we are processing more and more packets, so we want uh, to, to only uh, flush or send the TX packets at the end of that loop. We do not release the uh, and recycle pages yet. Uh, we only... Uh, 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 handle the pages once the TX routine uh, and the TX completion uh, gets back from hardware. Uh, we also added uh, XMIT more like meca mechanism. Um, as I said, once NAPI loop, NAPI loop completes, um, and if XTP uh, TX occurred one, at least once, uh, we push the uh, TX doorbell and uh, notify the hardware of uh, outgoing packets from XTP. Um, okay, a little bit uh, performance numbers. Um, I'm here com comparing um, the only solu solution we had to drop packets uh, before XDP was with the uh, TC filter uh, to drop uh, packets from hardware. Uh, we got to uh, 5.3 million, million packets per second. Uh, with XDP fast drop, we, with this model, we got to 16.5, uh, which is um, which is a lot faster. Um, and with XTP XMIT, um, as we see here, it's less than fast drop because we waste more CPU for um, forwarding packets, but uh, I'm sure this is uh, much better than uh, the IPv4 forwarding. Um, uh, those numbers as well uh, scale nicely um, if you uh, increase the number of cores. And uh, for Jamal here, uh, I have a number for you for, for when you uh, really uh, offload the uh, uh, hardware filter to the, the TC filter to the hardware. 
we get 46 million packets per second, and we can do more because this, is, was, this, this number was limited uh, with my uh, X-meter, but we're really talking about XDP here, so this is off topic. Uh, one small note here. Um, uh, thanks for doing that last test. So, Tom, this, this was my earlier point in the email, email exchange. This probably wasn't the best use case, right? If I can drop at 46 million packets per second in hardware uh, on a NIC like this, I don't see the point of using that as a use case for the MLX5. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so, sorry, Tom, first of all, about this number. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's like anything else. And we have to start with uh, comparisons, right? So if you compare this against the stack, great. If you compare it against the hardware, not so great. But the point here is that this is, this is the test case to begin with. We're trying to run at the speed of the CPU. There is no doubt that hardware <clears throat> can do stuff faster, but then hardware is it as programmable as this. So this packet drop becomes denial of service attack where I'm dropping pa packets with pattern XYZ. Am I going to be able to do that in the hardware as easily as XDP? So just think of the, the, the packet drop is not in itself useful, but it's a very important test. And also running this on a single CPU is also um, <coughs> really important. Uh, w one more thing, EPPF program is more powerful than any hardware filter, so this is no, one right. more okay. advantage for XDP. Um, Sayed, can we wrap it up so Yang Sung can, yeah, sure. can go? Yeah, um, sure. Um, I, I think that's it. Uh, future improvement, um, as I said, we, we need uh, to do more work for RX uh, staging and bulking. To, uh, uh, as now we have also um, an XDP TX, uh, more, m m more instruction to the RX routine, so we have to do the staging and to do it properly to have better performance. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the second one. Um, if we uh, remove the uh, requirement of a page per packet, uh, it will be really good because uh, with starting RQ, the, our first trial we did with XTP, we got to 32 million packets per second with starting RQ, which is not good for XDP because it does not do a page per packet. Um, also having a dedicated XDP RX rings uh, uh, might, uh, uh, might give us a good separation between XDP flows and uh, normal flows and uh, we wouldn't add uh, more complexity to the normal uh, stack uh, receive flow. Uh, one more thing, uh, zero copy. Uh, I think this is the only gap we have left to close against DPTK and um, Maybe net channels can solve that. Uh, I'm not sure. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, one reminder: DPTK is not Linux. Uh, XDP is. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Question? When was the slide made? Yeah. Um, <laughs> day before uh, Dave. So, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> this is quoted from Dave. So, thank you, Dave. Yeah. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Close the other one. Yeah. <laughs> 
close it. Okay, uh, this is Yun Song Lu, and uh, Yan is my colleague. We are from Huawei. We have been working on something on XDP. Today, I'm going to introduce what we have done and uh, also want to listen to your input. Basically, the, uh, okay. the first thing, right? Uh, when we talk about XDP, firstly, we are talking about uh, some fast I.O., network I.O. Basically, this is for the I.O. part. Uh, yes, in the last years, people said DPDK and NetMap can do better, could do better, right? But the thing is, why? We have been looking at those things. We don't think really DPDK is a high loading fruit for networking because you have to rebuild everything. Those information we used uh, maybe two years, uh, uh, since two years ago uh, in several conferences, but yeah, we have been thinking this way. Um, what we did is this, uh, we call it common Ethernet uh, driver framework, but we designed this four years ago, um, but for some different purpose. Originally, it was for virtualization because we were running uh, a different Linux uh, release and uh, uh, in different environments, so we needed some fast network I.O. driver framework for this work. Then we uh, designed a framework basically to handle the uh, virtual switch traffic, also for stack. And we ported Huawei's um, virtual switch to this, and we supported many drivers, hardware drivers, the Intel, Broadcom, Mellanox, and the Emulex, all those uh, 10 gig and 40 gig things. Also some accelerators, that's for data pass acceleration. But the thing is, we designed this, we, we saw some problems, right? Firstly, it was for virtualization. It really helped a little to the existing uh, stack. We also have changed the many uh, kernel modules. So that's the reason we had to keep it private for those usage. Of course, we got uh, very good performance and uh, we could install that on different Linux versions. Yeah, that's all small features, major features uh, we have done with the framework. Basically, it's fo we, are, we were focusing on more efficient me memory management, buffer management, the scheduling, TSRX scheduling, also the metadata part. Also, we made it uh, compatible with Linux IP stack. Also, we created some tools to tune some parameters. To be clear why we try to tune those parameters, we saw many different hardware, right? Um, we compared them. We saw different numbers. It's not easy to tell which hardware is really better because they really perform differently in different scenarios. So, but then also it's unclear what number will be correct for that hardware. For example, the receive queue size. Some hardware really need 4K buffers, but some hardware only need 256 buffers to do the, to do the uh, line rate. Yeah, that, um, that's what we have done. Uh, since XDP, we, we found a really good place to really port our work over to support XDP. Because XDP now is trying to do a uh, uh, much faster I.O. and network processing. The, those highlight items were done, were ported over for XDP particularly. Um, especially, we, we have done the buffer management, memory management, uh, metadata, and some other things. Uh, the very important is the workload to port the existing driver over to the new framework. Basically, it's less than 200 lines of code. Yeah, that's the, uh, what we changed and what we exposed to drivers. Just three very simple things. The size packet acquire, recycle, and uh, packet to SKD. That's uh, you simply, you get the buffer from the pool, you recycle it back to the pool, 
then you also convert a packet to SKB. Then, of course, we modify the free SKB function to make sure you don't really mess up the, the buffer management. Okay, what do we get? With SDP, simply we can get something like this. So the 40% is for non-SDP uh, traffic. For example, we just uh, change that, we test it against uh, uh, using Linux Bridge and OVS. You see 40% performance improvement. We expect the gen, you also see 40% improvement. Also with SDP dropping, early dropping, with one CPU thread, we saw we, we could see uh, 29, uh, milli, uh, million packet per second. Okay, let's see some numbers. Um, again, we use this, the numbers from Intel 40 gig uh, NIC, but it's not saying that's the best one, right? Because we saw different numbers, we just use the first one to, to show the numbers. The early drop means, as soon as SDP receive the bar, uh, packet, it just look at the packet and drop it. Don't re uh, it doesn't remove the buffer from the queue. Doesn't do any replacement. Then that's the best performance the software can get from the hardware we saw. It's one CPU thread. You, you can simply drop 29 million packets per second in kernel. Okay, uh, the second one is UDP drop. UDP drop basically uh, we just pass, uh, use this, pass it up to the IP stack. UDP will do a drop. Then we see, uh, we, 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 can, uh, we could get uh, 6 million packets per second. With bridge and uh, uh, packaging, we really saw the 40% improvement, particularly for XDP forwarding. As SDP forwarding, SDP introduced a new hook to driver, as uh, people have said many times, it's the early, very early stage of packet processing. We use that to forward the packet. Um, it's not simple forwarding. Um, the work is you really get the uh, packet, remove it from the queue, then look at the headers, change the MAC address, then put it on a sending queue, uh, transmission queue, TS queue, and then it will get DMA out. Then we get um, 9 million packets per second for one CPU thread. Basically, uh, 18 million packets per second for two CPU threads. That's fairly amazing because uh, that's already uh, better than some number we got from DPDK. Uh, but not the better number published by, uh, by, by, by some hardware vendors, but from in other environment, that's fairly amazing. Excuse me, when, yeah. when you were using these numbers, were you using transmit more on the packet gen? Yes. 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 Okay, the, I, I don't know why the numbers aren't much, much larger. I mean. Even on two-year-old machines, I was seeing 15 million, almost 15 million packets per second. It's for one, one flow. For one flow. With only one flow. Yes, also, we were seeing almost 30 million with packaging. With, uh, with ConnectX4, we get, uh, I believe, uh, 20 million, or 30 million, and one ring with packaging. Uh, with one core. Well, it was one core, of course. Yeah. One thread, one, this is one connection. Yeah, you need to more. transmit more. Transmit more. Did you use, what kernel were you using? Uh, it was 4.7. 4. 4. 4. 4. Yeah. Okay, 4. good. So you have to run again this test? Yes, certainly. We, we get, okay, that's a, that's a link to the numbers. That's all details of the hardware, and we get the code there. Uh, you may just try it out. For, the, the, the major thing is we were not focusing on packaging those things. We just uh, did some verification. We saw some very obvious improvement. Okay, basically look at the buffer management we have designed for that. It's fairly complicated uh, on this screen. Basically there are three layers, right? The first layer is the memory management for networking I.O. Basically that's, uh, you can do, you can allocate a bulk memory for uh, you including many pages, or you can use single pages. Also you potentially can use huge page for the for memory. Then the second layer, is the buffer management that will get pages from the, the memory pools to create buffer pools. The buffer pool will be used for drivers to get the packet uh, buffer for its DMA and uh, 
packet processing. The third part is the packet pool TSQ for TSQ and RSQ. Yeah, we, we uh, use the one whole 40 page for one packet. Basically, that's the uh, design. Uh, we really reserved the room for uh, SKB, then make it very simple to convert a packet to SKB without reallocate anything. Just reuse the buffer, the same page. There is header room. We use, uh, also, you can, there, particularly there is metadata. You can customize your metadata for the packet for different purposes. Yes, in the, in the last, um, since, since uh, June, uh, we, uh, when we had the SDP summit at Facebook, we have made some major changes. Firstly, we have changed the SDP code to be able to forward to a different net, uh, net device, including the virtual link, like uh, the user or the host. Another thing is metadata. We, uh, now we uh, can support some customizable metadata and also reserve the header room. And then the, log, uh, the, the transmit queue. Um, actually, the original implementation is to uh, avoid locking for the transmit, uh, transmit queue. But the things we, we saw also saw different things. If it's lock free, certainly performance is much better, but you need to resolve the hardware. But another thing is uh, to be more generic, you can simply reuse any queue, queue for SDP forwarding. Here is just a current what we have in the code. Of course, we can we can discuss more in detail. Yeah, for the next step of the the work is we are uh, currently we are merging all those changes to the XDP GitHub Git. Uh, that's being uh, that's under code review, and hopefully you can anyone uh, will be welcome. To, to review our code and see what we need to improve. Also, we are um, discussing how to share the metadata format among those SDP applications. If any application will pass the header, create its own metadata is another cost. Of course, it's more generic. Of course, we, we are discussing whether we should define some more simple metadata. The acceleration API is under, uh, is being developed. How to accelerate the whole thing to accelerator. Also virtualization support, particularly how to uh, support the virtual switch to, uh, to, to have a better virtual switch performance and the load balancer things. Okay, just uh, those information. Any questions? Yeah, uh, could you precise what kind of change you did in Carefree SKB? Just for my... I can answer this question. <laughs> sure, please. So, Eric, the whole thing is that he, linear, he linearly inserts the SK buff metadata past the end of the packet data. So in k 3 SKB, he checks this. Oh, this is a linear thing that just has the SK buff plus the data, just free the, uh, the memory object up once. So there's no separation between the metadata allocation and the packet data allocation, and that's why it's faster. So how about all the other paths that might change SKB head, like uh, PSKB expand and stuff like right, that. Right, they have to allocate a new SKB head. So, but they he mentioned only one point in the stack, but apparently they had to change a lot of points. It's not yeah. only k SKB. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a, a change in the, in the model for SKB management, for sure, and there's a lot of places that need to be changed. Yes, I agree. Yeah, there's uh, changes in the, uh, the free, KA free SKBs. Uh, the, there is a, uh, specifically, in there is a, a signature of the uh, buffer side, so that when you set, when you free the SKB, you have to check this, if this is from our packet. If it is, then using our free SKB routine, otherwise using that. So this is kind of, uh, you can have some more improvement on that, but this is currently the, the uh, solution we have right now. And one thing that's nice about this is that if you have a, if we have our configuration where XTP traffic is shared on a queue with normal stack traffic, the transition into a full-bledged SKB object is really fast. We don't incur another allocation. Yes. Yeah, that's true. It's really nice. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I'd like to add more uh, comment on the uh, forwarding part. The, uh, 
for all the work, we get like a, uh, close to 10 million PPS. It's because of we actually added, we uh, changed a little bit of the forwarding mechanism of uh, X, XDP. So because the normal XDP forwarding was just uh, bouncing back to the uh, original interface, but we made some changes so that we, you, we can actually forward into different, uh, any uh, net device so that locking is required. So that's why we see the difference between the, uh, uh, the, the numbers. So this number, actually the 9.6 number is basically sending, it's also bouncing back. But if you want actually forward to the different interface, which could be a different driver, different hardware, it could be a, a little bit slower than this. And also we can, I, actually forward to a virtual device like a VE pair, so that, uh, so just using the uh, start exmit, standard uh, start exmit uh, function. So in the uh, VE pair, so we see some kind of like a uh, six million PPS, because the, uh, it sends the, the one side, the other side actually sent to the, uh, the protocol stack the jobs in the UDP set. So, yeah, the, this the is six the, million was yeah, get from the, the pair. This, six million yeah. because uh, we actually uh, actually forward to the uh, the the, uh, the virtual NIC. So that's the difference, I think. So yeah, we do have some changes on that uh, XDP forwarding semantic, but I, I don't know if it is uh, good or bad. But uh, we did at least the. Uh, the, the experiment, experiment. Say we actually can, uh, the, the BPF code can actually uh, change our metadata portion. So you can keep your if index in our, in our metadata and then in the driver you can actually, depends on the metadata IF index to forward to different. Uh, okay, any uh, other questions? So, so. Um, the UDP drop, where did you actually do that? What? Uh, uh, the kernel stack UDP drop, where did you actually, how did you drop the packet? Uh, uh, we just, just sent to we the pair to the stack, the stack, the UDP part won't receive it and drop it simply. Uh, sorry, again, I didn't understand. The stack will drop the packet. Because uh, no, no one listen to the drops. This is just a regular test without any, uh, where is it drop? Uh, just the default drop. So it's in the bridge? No, no, no. no. Uh, UDP, you go to the UDP. stack. UDP won't receive it, then drop it, simply drop it. Ah, it's, it's a socket layer. So yeah, you, yeah. you don't yeah, take yeah, a yeah, socket yeah. and you drop it. Okay. But not go through socket, it's still in kernel. By generating a lot of... So what are, they, are there a lot of ICMPs coming out of this then? What? I see, there's no ICMP that because of the drop of destination or port, what? Some unreachable. Yeah, that's right. right. So unreached. So, does that affect your start, uh, your results then? So there's, a, like, a, if you don't have the port in, uh, listening, then it just drops, right? There's a right limiter on the ICMP, so you can send, like, 1,000 ICMP message back per second, so it's not going to kill the, the performance. No. Yeah, any other questions? We have the next presenter. Thank you. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Prem Janal Garda. I'm with uh, Barefoot Networks. Today, I want to demonstrate to you what we have done as far as getting one of the XDP use cases, which is an ILA router, to run on our switch. So this is running on the switch, not the server. So just to kind of set the context, uh, what I'm going to show today is what's happening on that NVE, the Network Virtualization Edge box. As far as running that functionality on the server, I think uh, uh, Tom covered it yesterday showed how the flow works and everything. 
So this is basically taking that same functionality and running it on our top of rack switch. So here's a, a quick setup for the demo. So we have two Tofino switches uh, with two hosts connected to them. The hosts are non-ILA hosts. They're communicating using SIR addresses. And uh, Tofino switches will do the translation from SIR to ILA and ILA back to SIR. So this is all happening on the switch. The host doesn't know anything about this. So just to give a little bit more context, what, what is Tofino? What is Barefoot Tofino? It's a 6.5 terabits per second fully programmable Ethernet switch ASIC. Um, it's quite the beast, actually. Um, it has 6,500 gigabit Ethernet ports on it. Um, the full user programmability is achieved using P4, so you can write any program on P4, use our compiler, put it on the switch, it runs at line rate. Some of the things we can do, we can do a full top of rack switch functionality. Um, we can do load balancer, firewall, uh, DOS, INTs, in-band network telemetry. You can do things like um, you know, per packet visibility. Actually, any type of packet processing we can do. And all of it runs at uh, 6.5 terabits per second. So there's also a program called Switch to P4, which we have written. It implements all the data plane uh, features that you would need on a typical top of rack switch, or a spine switch, or a core switch, whatever. Uh, it's uh, fully uh, developed and also open source. This is quite a big deal because if you want to get visibility into the data plane of a top of rack switch, it's, they're all kind of closed. You don't know how things are done. So this one gives you full visibility into the, the pipeline. Last but not the least, it's not an FPGA, it's not an NPU, it's not a CPU, it's an Ethernet ASIC. Uh, it runs at 6.5 terabits per second. Just to give you some pictures, this is how it looks. I couldn't carry it here, it's quite heavy. Um, and I don't think it'll get through customs. Um, this is another picture with the top off. Um, even the LEDs are programmable. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, okay, so this is, this is just to give the context. Now, a little bit more uh, details on how we accomplish this. So we start with our Switch Talk P4 program, which has all the features that you need in a top of rack switch, and then we modified it to add the ILA functionality to it. So then we take that program, run it through a P4 compiler. It generates the machine code for Barefoot Tofino. So we download that onto the switch. Then it also generates APIs. These are auto-generated using the compiler. And those APIs are you know, mated with a control plane. Right now we're using a simple Python script as a control plane. And then there's the control plane interaction happening where you can you know, program the table, insert entries, and all that stuff. So this, back to the demo setup, right? So this is what's happening. So these are just the details on what addresses we are using. The SIR address uh, with the ILA prefix of 4444 slash 64 is used. So the end hosts are just using their addresses the 01 and 02 addresses, and uh, all the translation into ILA happens on the switch. And you can see at the top the, um, let's see where the laser is. Okay. So this is the translated uh, ILA address. This is the SIR address. So the both, both hosts have the SIR addresses on them. Um, so Tofino is basically looking this address up in its tables and then rewriting the address to the ILA address. Uh, one thing to note is it's also doing this checksum neutral translation. So it's actually going to set the checksum neutral bit and then adjust the last uh, a few bytes to make sure that the checksum doesn't get uh, invalid. So the packet goes from here to this guy and this guy just translates it back to this address and sends it to the host. The hosts don't know this is happening, but you know the switch is doing both the translations. So with that, I'm going to attempt to run the demo. So 
so what we have here is a vagrant box. Uh, let me just do this. And we use a tool called uh, Mininet to set up these switches and the hosts um, and set up the network. So let's run this. So it's setting up the host, configuring their addresses, setting up the switches, installing entries. And OK, it's set up. So now I have the Mininet CLI. And from here, I'm actually going to ping the two hosts. And then I'm going to log into the Docker containers that are simulating the switch and do a TCP dump and show you the translator address. Right. So let's go. So this is switch one. So this is my switch one, and this is switch two. OK. So let me just run the TCP dump over here. As you can see in the, you know, so you can already see the translation, but let me run it live. Okay, TCP dump is running. So H1 config. So as you can see, this is host one. Can you guys see it, or do I have to increase the font? Okay. So this is host one, and H2 if config. This is host two, and I'm just going to ping from host one to host two, and let's see what happens. Okay, so let me just increase this. So as you can see, this is switch one and switch two. So the address is getting translated, um, you know, from. So you should actually look at this translation because that's the direction um, towards host two. It got translated into the ILA address. Checksum neutral bit is set, and then the checksum neutral correction is done. And then the same thing over here. Um, where is it? So going to one, it's changed. Uh, sorry, it's actually. Where is the translation over here? Should probably ping a little bit longer. Anyway, one, one side I can show. I think maybe I'm not uh, showing the right interface on this side. But you can see the translation happening on both, both ways, right? You can see that here. Both addresses are getting translated from SIR address to ILA and then ILA to SIR. So that's the, that's the extent of the demo. If you want to see the code, so this is what we've done um, to enable ILA in our switch.p4. These are just ILA actions added to our regular IPv6 processing. Um, if you open IPv6.v4, so all we needed to do with the regular IPv6 processing that we're already doing is add a couple more actions to do ILA. Um, and then all the corresponding APIs and uh, uh, everything that is needed to configure this stuff in the hardware uh, is auto-generated. So that's, that's the extent of the demo. I mean, we can, we can do all the XTP-related uh, use cases in our switch. Uh, we just showcased uh, ILA for now. Any questions? Okay, there's no questions uh, before I leave. I just want to give uh, thanks to a few people. First, Milad Sharif, he's the engineer who worked on this. It's not me. 
Uh, he did all the work. I'm just showing it. And Tom Herbert, thanks for reviewing what he did. And also, thanks to the organizers and Tom for giving us this opportunity to present. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to shoot them at me, or I'm around, yeah. so come grab me. Um, I'm wondering, have you measured the performance of this patent? So no, not yet. So we can actually do it on our hardware. We haven't done that yet. This is just a uh, you know, simulated switch, right? OK, and then how do you see the relationship between P4 and XDP? So obviously, this is not XDP, but you mentioned that it handles all the XDP use cases. Do you foresee a translation from XDP to P4? How would, how would that work? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good topic, actually. Uh, I mean, it goes along the lines of what um, uh, Gilad was saying uh, earlier and also the metronome ways are dealing with. Uh, right now, it's like, hey, this is what XTP does. OK, let's do it in P4. So right now, that's what's happening, right? Uh, translation, I mean, there's a P4 dbpf uh, compiler already available. John has one. Um, you know, there's one in IOWiser. Uh, it's not something we haven't uh, we, we have fully grappled with yet. I, I, having thought about this a bit, it's it's quite easy, or I would say it's um, conceivable to go from P4 to eBPF, and yeah. hence yeah. into XDP yeah. with the right set of helper functions and metadata. We would need to add a few helper functions and a few things to make this work. But um, for example, we can do it in the the, the classifier ingress classifier today. Um, without much trouble. Um, but going the other way is, is quite a challenge, right? Because you're, you're taking a P4 model of a switch ASIC and trying to load an instruction set into that. Yeah. And I'm not convinced that the, that there's, um, that, that it, it actually A, can be done, and B, that there's a whole lot of value in going that way. But uh, I would definitely be interested to hear if anybody is really interested in trying to do that. It, it's the same question as trying to JIT onto building a JIT for fixed ASICs, right, from eBPF. It's like the space of programs that would actually be, um, that could actually do this is so small compared to the sort of universe of programs that you can write in, a, in an instruction set language. So um, that's at least that's my thoughts on it. So. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, yeah, this is something we've been trying to look at. But when we tried to see how we can take eBPF and then translate it back to P4, you know, wasn't wasn't clear. Yes. Yeah, if EPPF doesn't make sense, don't use it, man. Just just because it exists. <laughs> <laughs> if you can yeah, you can translate one way. If you, it's not easy to go the other way, you know. Yes, yeah. you have the bread slicer. You don't have to use it to slice oranges. Um, so, I mean, yeah, of course. Um, one, one, one thing that's interesting to me here is you've got this general purpose language which has very small instructions, like eBPF has very simple instructions, right? Yeah. And you can only do whatever many of them per clock. And, you know, the, the, the power is limited. And then you have these things which have extremely complicated, you've got like these ternary matches on very, very yeah. wide TCAM entries. Yeah. Yeah. And they're super fast. Yeah. And you can't do anything else with them. Sure. So, what like if if we were to think about it, like what what sort of hybrid could we build that would give you both of these? And like, could you build this stuff into eBPF? As could you have a? Um, you, you obviously can't do it using eBPF instructions at any reasonable speed. It's way too slow, right? But if yeah. you had calls to like, if eBPF has a way to call the hardware functionality, you could kind of write the main program in eBPF and then use these sophisticated matches. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, I think the abstract model on which eBPF operates on and the abstract model on which P4 operates on are different. Um, like I think you brought up a good example, right? I mean, TCAMs these. Our switch has TCAMs in it, and it's very fast. Um, so how do you translate? Like, let's say you describe a TCAM in P4. How do you translate that into eBPF? Uh, it breaks, you know. So yeah, can you take the code and put it in uh, into our hardware? Yes, but you will not be using the full full power of it, right? 
So this is a, yeah, we're still trying to figure it out. All right, thank you.